So one of the things that a few of us at Reading are talking about, um, namely myself, Rosa Freeman, Rosemary Ochmady, um, and a few other people like us, is doing a, an academic freedom training program. Uh, and fundamental to the academic freedom training program is A, helping people understand the law, right? Um, because, you know, we trip up because we, we don't know the law sometimes. Um, but also actually laying bare how the logic of doing academia, doing critique, doing knowledge production, is totally different than the logic of doing politics. So with academic work, you have to ask questions. Um, as as uh, Alice said, you have to be curious. You have to not know the answer. You have to be able to ask a question that may be really politically heterodox. Um, but if you're doing politics, you shut the world down. You say, this is the world, this is the problem, and this is the solution. So I think we need to start training our academics, training our students, and then pushing it out into the wide world. I think that's right, and, uh, but I think that there is a huge problem here in that that presupposes this distinction between true and false, <laughs> which we have entire departments of people in gender studies, for example, who do not accept that distinction. Mm. They, own, they think the only thing that exists is power. There's no such thing as true and false. Well, we shouldn't have academic departments where people think that because mm. that's like, that's a religion. That's not science, it's not empirical inquiry. Um, so I don't know what the solution is there. <laughs> I think, uh, just to go back to journalism for a second, um, there's a similar problem with, with truth and, and fact and so on. So I wrote a book review last year for the FT, and I hadn't written for a long time, and it was a, it was a not very good book about, um, uh, about male violence against women. And I said, I wrote a sentence which started, um, murders of trans women are rare in the UK, whereas women are murdered at a rate of between two and three a week. And the, I thought it was all fine, they said it was fine. And then I was in a bar in Rome, a very noisy bar, and I got called at seven o'clock in the evening. Um, and I was told by the literary editor at the FT that a group of people at the paper um, wanted to add a sentence saying, murders of, in the UK of, of trans women are rare, but disproportionately high to the number of, of trans people in the country. And I said, but this is not true. And he said, no, but people here feel very uncomfortable with not saying that. And also, people here feel very uncomfortable because you've said that murders of, with, um, of trans women in this country are rare, and they feel that the word rare is pejorative. And I was saying, but surely it's a good thing. I mean, isn't it a good thing when not many people are being murdered? And in the end, we, we had a long, you know, a very noisy bar, it's coming and going. In the end, they took that reference out. But he, 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 he did not know, and he'd just been told by, apparently there's, a lot of newspapers now have a, a sort of LGBT group, and they do seem to have an ability. This was a 500-word book review. They seem to have an ability to actually look at your look at copy, anything that touches on the trans issue, feminism, or whatever. And they they're allowed to say we don't like this, and to say you know we want to add things or take them out. I mean, it's just extraordinary. Yeah. That's Shocking. not journalism. No. Well, I, I, I did read the LGBT action plan, and my mouth just dropped open. I mean, it's yeah. a completely captured document, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I thought I thought it was wonderful that you know the, there was all this stuff about uh, aromantic people and how they need support, etc. And I was thinking, didn't that used to be sort of shaggers? And you know, why why do they need support? <laughs> <laughs> it now seems as if anybody who can say they've got an identity has to have a support group and a plan. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And a dog. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I can try and say something, not to avert the panic, because I know exactly what you're saying, and I felt similar panic and, and, and incredulity and despair with, with the main left, left-wing parties, but... But I do want to say I don't think we should abandon the left. No. And I think that is a really dangerous road that, that some women who've, you know, who are in this battle and who feel that despair 
if they think the solution is to throw up their hands and vote for a party that is in the long term not going to be in the interests of women, of minorities, of you know, sexual minorities, racial minorities, any minority, um, I think that's a really dangerous route to go down. So I think we have to remember that those of us who are on the left, we are the left. We have to somehow, you know, stay in that space and, and make the arguments that we've always been making and, and hope that we can form alliances with enough people within leftist movements because, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I can't say I'm optimistic, but I, what scares me more is the prospect that, that women will abandon the left en masse and will end up in a very, very dangerous place for, for women and for all, you know. But it is terrifying, isn't it? It it's is terrifying. just terrifying, it is terrifying the yeah. sheer stupidity of it. Yeah. You know, when you see David Lammy claiming live on air that men can grow a cervix, <laughs> <laughs> how, how did the left come to this? <laughs> I just don't understand. And we've, we've got, what, 18 months to to educate them and they don't want to listen to us. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's been really painful, the mm -hmm. fact that, you know, I'm, I'm a member of the Labour Party, I'm in the same um, branch as Keir Starmer. I'd love to talk to you, Keir, <laughs> if you're listening, but, you know, of course he's not listening. So uh, there's all these women who want to share their expertise with the Labour Party, many are Labour Party members, and they just want to stay in their bubble. I find that so distressing and so self-destructive for the left. Oh, well, it's, it's two years next month since I... Um, uh, no, it's a year next month that, that I um, spoke to Keir Starmer about this at the Labour Women's Network dinner, because I'm a member of the Labour Party very reluctantly, and um, confronted him and said, you know, I, I wrote to you over a year previous to that, um, saying that I was very worried about misogyny in the Labour Party and that, you know, I know lots of women who are counsellors and who don't dare say they're gender critical and their emotions going around CLPs condemning us and, you know, making you, telling the usual lies about the Heritage Foundation and everything. And he was kind of, oh my God, you know, oh, this is so, you know, I never saw your letter, this is so awful. <laughs> and I said, well, it looks to me like you don't give a damn about misogyny in the Labour Party. Oh no, you know, so I said, okay, I'll write to you again later this week and let's see if we can actually talk about this. And uh, so I wrote to him again, and it'll be um, so. It's, it's just over just over two years since I first wrote to him, and then I wrote, spoke to him um, 11 months ago and wrote to him again, and absolutely nothing. And you know, same with Sadiq Khan, same with Margaret Beckett, um, who doesn't answer letters. Um, I mean, it's all of us are. In, I mean, the joke about this is that we're all incredibly polite. Yeah. You know, we all write mm. reasoned, nice, polite letters. We don't swear. I mean, I swear a lot, in, you know, with friends, but not when I'm doing public stuff. And um, and they just will not respond. I mean, it's now, I think it's two and a half years now since I wrote to Sadiq Khan asking if he still supports the um, exemptions in the Equality Act, which mm. he voted for as a Labour MP when, in 2009 when he voted for the Equality Bill. They won't answer. And it's a mm. huge problem for us on the mm. left. They're not listening. I think, though, to come back to the should you give up hope and panic and emigrate, um, don't. Um, <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know, if we are the left and we are the left, uh, we need to be in there and we need to be in the fight. And, you know, it was Angela Davis who said that uh, freedom was a constant struggle. Um, and I think that we have to remember this. Uh, even meetings like this today, we have to form the networks, we have to keep talking. Um, and, you know, we may, I mean, the, the plan is crazy in Wales. I read it and I just, my heart sank and I thought, okay, so we're going to be looking at another Isle of Bryson. Mm. before Wales does something. We're going to be looking at another Tavistock clinic before Wales does something, and that's such a sad place to be. Uh, but if you give up, then that's, a ne that, that's going to be the absolute certain outcome. Um, so, you know, well, well done for all of you for actually sticking in there. I think, so Helen Joyce talked about this recently. Uh, we had a conference at UCL um, on education for women's liberation. And Helen was talking about how the power of being boring, and I think very much 
you know, things we can all do as keyboard warriors, which is things like every time someone sends you a survey or an equalities form or a questionnaire that says gender instead of sex or it has stupid categories, write to them and challenge it very politely, very nicely, point out what the Equality Act says, point out what the protected characteristics are. Um, every time you see a safeguarding failure in an organisation, raise it. I mean, there is so much work out there to be done, mm -hmm. so there is no shortage of um, work to do for anyone. You certainly don't have to be an academic. I think we could all work on this full time if, if we <laughs> had the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's true, and I think that there's sort of small local ways in which you can mm -hmm. act proactively. For example, if you've got kids at school, go and talk to the teachers. You know, what are they doing in the PSHE curriculum? Talk to the head teachers. What resources are they using? And the kind of things that, that Alice was saying. But also, I think there's something profoundly depressing behind your comment, because in fact, a lot of organisations and individuals have been shouting about the harm that is being mm -hmm. done to women and girls, have been collecting the evidence and documenting it and, and showing very loudly what damage, real damage is being done in areas that you'd think would speak to ordinary people, like, you know, sport, you know, like fair play for women. For years now, it's been showing that women are losing out, literally losing out on sporting medals, mm -hmm. you know, in, in sports that they've trained for years for, being put off competing in amateur events. And I, I think when this first started to come to light, I sort of naively thought, well, surely when everybody sees that, you know, there'll be this outrage. But what's really depressing is that people know that harm has been done, and they don't care, because people don't care about what happened. A lot of people are, I think, this is what Joan said right at the beginning, there is a level of misogyny yeah. that is mm -hmm. now coming to the surface when you realise how many people just don't care that women are losing out and being harmed. And that, for me, has been one of the most depressing parts of this mm. battle, actually. But that's not to say there aren't things you can keep doing. <laughs> I think it is worth chasing people like producers that women, women's are, you know, emailing the programme, um, texting the programme, doing all of that and saying, you know, why aren't you interviewing Hannah Barnes? Um, you know, that yeah. we, I mean, it's very clear, you know, we know a series of books that come out that are very important. And you think, well, why isn't Hel Helen Joyce being interviewed mm -hmm. here? And it, it, it is worth actually chasing those. And, you know, friends of mine are actually, you know, going around bookshops all over, all over the country, sort of demanding Hannah Barnes's book and various other books that have just come out, Hags, you know, obviously Victoria Smith mm -hmm. and so on. I think that's really worth doing because otherwise there becomes a narrative that, oh, well, people, never, people don't want to discuss these things. People don't ask for these books. So you actually have to counter mm -hmm. that. It's hard work. You know, we've all got other things to do, but it's, I, think, I think it's worth it. I think one of the great things, is that Helen Joyce's talk at that uh, conference is on video, isn't it? Mm. Um, and you can look at it, because she actually has a lot of just simple things. I mean, she lists them, doesn't she? Yeah. Um, and yeah. that, that's, that, I think, is really helpful. I wish I had an answer. Um, I don't. I know that there's a, different, a world of difference between things like lawfare, you know, going to law and going to courts like Lisa Keogh, you know, myself and Maya and the others who have gone to court, that's one thing. But actually that's not going to change anything because a law means nothing unless it's implemented. Um, so that sort of boring level of activism is actually how we're going to change things. Um, and I think there is more space now because I remember about two and a half years ago when um, when, when uh, Liz Truss made it clear she wasn't going to update the GRA, um, I was asked to go on Woman's Hour to talk about why I oppose it. And, and, you know, I said I'd do that. They couldn't find anybody who would appear with me. Everybody turned, you know, there was all, it was no debate. And eventually they found a trans woman who I happen to know called Helen Belcher. But she said she wouldn't actually appear with me. And <laughs> even though we were doing it by, by Zoom, that she couldn't bear to be in, you know, in the same Zoom call or whatever, or same <laughs> studio. So I, I was on the phone from home. And they, had, they agreed to interview him, in my view. Um, and then come to me. Um, and I said on air, you know, wh wh why is Helen not prepared to debate this? And the answer was, um, oh, she feels very vulnerable. And again, I'm five foot four. I mean, come on. So anyway... Could that be the case? Joe, you're nodding. Yeah, I'd say yes, but I'd add to that what Joan started with. 
This is, this is just, it's just misogyny. Yeah. That's all it is. Um, do you know what I mean? It's, you know, you can call it whatever you want. How the left got there is a whole series of steps and moves around progression and what progression stands for. But the left has also, like the right, has had its problems with authoritarianism. Yeah, yeah so. absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I think the question of how we got here is, is much more complex. I mean, I don't disagree with anything that you've said or that, that mm -hmm. Joe said, but I think there are other parts of the story that explain how, how this ideology is, is not just come about, but how it's been enabled to thrive in particular contexts, because it's not thriving everywhere in the world, right? Mm -hmm. This is a very Western <laughs> particular <laughs> ideology, right? And it's thrived in particular Western capitalist societies, and I think that also has something to do with it. I think this is, at its heart, a quite individualistic, liberal, consumerist kind of idea that, you know, you can purchase things that will enable you to be a, a more complete person, that you can construct, you, know, you can invent yourself by buying stuff or by, you know, paying to have bits of yourself. I mean, that is something that arises in particular contexts. Mm -hmm. And so I expect the story is, is a bit more complex, but we don't have time probably to go into <laughs> all of it.